I invite you to take your Bibles and turn to 2 Timothy, the second chapter, beginning in the first verse. Second Timothy, the second chapter, beginning with verse 1. You therefore, my son, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And the things that you have heard from me, among many witnesses, commit these to faithful men who will be able to teach others also. You therefore must endure hardship as a good soldier of Jesus Christ. No one engaged in warfare entangles himself with the affairs of this life, that he may please him who enlisted him as a soldier. And also, if anyone competes in athletics, he is not crowned unless he competes according to the rules. The hard-working farmer must be first to partake of the crops. Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. The Apostle Paul sincerely cares for this young man to whom he's writing, named Timothy. He's probably the closest thing that Paul had to a true son. And here he refers to him as a son of the faith in the first chapter of this book, showing the deep connection that he has to him, that he wants him to be strong. And here he is seeking to give him courage in a very certain area that he may stand strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. And Paul is exhorting Timothy to be strong here in this instance because we can read in the context above that there's a lot of individuals who are not. Notice in chapter 1 and in verse 15, This you know that all those in Asia have turned away from me, among whom are Phygelus and Hermogenes. There are different individuals who have left the faith, who have departed from Paul and are not trusting in the things with which he did deliver to them originally. But yet he is seeking to give this encouragement, this word here to Timothy, to stand strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus. Everyone in Asia has left me, Timothy. They've all turned away from the gospel. But don't you. You hold fast to this. You stand strong in this grace that is in Christ Jesus. Paul desires Timothy to be strong in this grace of Christ. In the second verse there, he tells us exactly, or in the first verse there, he tells us exactly that. But what is the grace of Christ Jesus? We know how grace is the favor that God had for man, that while we were in our sinful state, that while we were still a sinner, that He provided a gift for us, that moved, that God, or that moved God to save man, to take action on His behalf. In Romans, the fifth chapter, and in verse 15, it tells us of that gift of God's grace. In Romans 5 and in verse 15, It says, But the free gift is not like the offense. For if by one man's offense many died, much more the grace of God and the gift by the grace of the one man, Jesus Christ, abounded to many. By Jesus dying on the cross, men do not have to suffer eternal death for the sin that they committed in their lives that would cause them to be lost and separated from God. But yet we can be saved by that sacrifice that Jesus did make on Calvary's cross. In Romans, the fifth chapter, and in verse 8, it says, But God demonstrates His own love toward us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. What great love came from this grace of God, that when He sent His Son Jesus to die for us while we were still sinners, this is what took place. This is how God demonstrated grace unto us. That Jesus Christ, His only Son, died and provided this sacrifice for us that we may be saved. But where do I see this demonstration of grace? Where is it something that I can view, that I can see? Well, grace is something that's revealed throughout the Gospel. The Holy Spirit tells men exactly how we must live. In Titus, the second chapter, notice what the Apostle Paul says here regarding this idea of grace in Titus 2. And in the 11th verse, the Apostle Paul 
by divine inspiration says here, For the grace of God that brings salvation has done what? Has appeared to all men, teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age. By God's grace, He has provided a way for us to understand how we might live that we could be standing strong in the grace of Christ. That we could see how it is that He would have us to live to where we would be pleasing in His eyes. What a wonderful thing that is. To where we could know the answers of what we must do. Tonight, we want to take some time to look at just how it is that we can do that. We want to take some time and see what that text there in 2 Timothy showed us. To find out the way of just how it is that we can be strong. In the Lord's grace. The first example that Paul mentions in 2 Timothy is of a man that we are not exactly too familiar with. A name that we don't exactly focus on a lot, but his name is Onesiphorus. Therefore, Timothy. When we think of the word therefore, it's usually conjoining two different thoughts. Saying that it's going to summarize what he had just been talking about. And in the immediate verses, wrapping up chapter 1 of 2 Timothy, Paul has been discussing this man Onesiphorus and the things that he did for him and how he was a good example of being strong in the Lord's grace. Timothy, be like Onesiphorus. You, therefore, be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus like Onesiphorus. Read with me in 2 Timothy 1 about this man. It says, Then the Lord... The Lord grant mercy to the household of Onesiphorus, for he often refreshed me and was not ashamed of my chains. But when he arrived in Rome, he sought me out very zealously and found me. The Lord grant him, to him that day that he may find mercy from the Lord in that day. And you know very well how he ministered to me. At Ephesus, Onesiphorus was someone we would classify as being a true servant to Paul, that he took all these different actions. He's going out of his way to make sure that Paul is taken care of in this situation that he finds himself. He was not ashamed of Paul's imprisonment. Paul has been placed in prison by the Roman authorities for preaching the gospel, but that's not something that Onesiphorus is scared of, that he's shying away from. He realizes that's the case that Paul's been locked up. And he's not saying, oh, Paul, he's gone. I'm going to go find him. That's what his mindset is. He's going to go and seek him out in a what kind of manner? Very zealously seeking him out, finding him, taking action, looking for him. And what? He, he found him. He was able to find him and refresh his spirit, to give him encouragement. A man who's been in prison for preaching the gospel, Paul, is encouraged by Onesiphorus. He's been, had his spirits uplifted by this man here. And Onesiphorus is working this way. And what's the end result? Well, Paul desires the Lord's mercy to be shown to Onesiphorus and his household, to these individuals, when the Lord does come back again on that final judgment day. But when we think about Paul's desire for mercy in the future upon Onesiphorus and his household, that kind of shows me that his household was, as well was involved in these different actions. His household was not ashamed that Paul was in prison for preaching the gospel. His household was not ashamed of the things that Paul was preaching, but they're searching out Paul zealously along with Onesiphorus. They're encouraging his spirits. They're standing firm in this manner along with Onesiphorus, the leader of this household. They're manifesting this hospitality to Paul. They're making sure that it is something that is able to be seen, that it is shown, and that we have record to see today of how it is that this man here that we don't know a whole lot about, but these three verses, what do they, they tell us that he stood strong in the Lord's grace. And Timothy, be like him. Be exactly like him. Both he and his family are the kind of individuals who are able to stand strong in the Lord's grace, that are making the effort to do so, to carry it out in their lives. 
by showing mercy unto Paul when Paul was in chains. Onesiphorus and his household will receive gracious mercy from the Lord because of these actions that they took when Paul is in this situation. They have the confidence to serve because they know what is ahead of them. They didn't simply do it because, well, maybe Paul will give us you know, some help in that regard. No, they're doing it because it's the right thing to do. Because they knew that this is something that needed to happen in their lives. And thus they carry it out in this way. And they're classified as individuals that stood strong in the Lord's grace. What a wonderful thing. Paul also tells Timothy that he is to be strong in the grace by teaching this testimony of the Lord. Don't, don't shy away from preaching the gospel, Timothy. I'm in prison for preaching this same message, but you commit it to faithful men. You understand it. You hold to it. You strengthen yourself in it enough to where you can teach it to others also. To where you can pass that same message along. Timothy needed to be strong in what it was that he heard from Paul because it was the gospel's message. Timothy needed to keep preaching this pattern of sound words. Notice in Timothy, or first Timothy, or 2 Timothy 1 and in verse 13. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me, in faith and love, which are in Christ Jesus. He needed to keep preaching this pattern, this tested pattern that Paul had provided to him, and keep carrying it out. Continue this kind of work. He was to preach the gospel at all times. In chapter 4 and in verse 2, preach the word. Be ready in season and out of, se out of season. Convince, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering in teaching. There's not a time when the gospel does not need to be preached, and he needed to strengthen himself so that he's able to preach it at all times and be able to teach others also. That he has enough confidence in his knowledge of the gospel and what he knows and what he understood from Paul that he can teach it to others also. Timothy was to teach this testimony to. Faithful men, as the text says, that's the Greek word anthropos, which usually is an indefinite article for a male or female. So it wasn't just faithful men, it wasn't just men who were preachers, but all who would be classified as faithful men or women. It needed to be taught to others fully so that they can teach others the gospel as well, so that it would continue in this cycle of people who are strong in this pattern of sound words, in the gospel's message, and they can teach it in turn to others. That's the goal here. That is what Paul is emphasizing to Timothy, and he's showing how he can be strong in the grace that is in Christ Jesus by doing so. The Greek word pistis that we spent time looking at a few weeks ago, is the same word here for faithful, being that these individuals, these men and women, need to be ones that are trustworthy, that are of good fidelity, that they are understood. And they had to be trustworthy because they in turn needed to be able to communicate this same message that Paul told Timothy originally. So they're hearing this message that Paul told Timothy, well, how can we trust Timothy? In 1 Corinthians 4, it tells, notice what Paul says. In 1 Corinthians, the fourth chapter, about Timothy as an individual. 1 Corinthians 4, and in verse, verse 17, it says, For this reason I have sent Timothy to you, who is my beloved and faithful son in the Lord, who will remind you of my ways in Christ as I teach everywhere in every church. Paul had enough faith, enough confidence in Timothy as an individual that he could teach the things that he had taught him originally to where he's able to do this. And he's trusting Timothy to teach the things that he taught him originally. To pass it along in a way to faithful individuals, ones that are trustworthy. That when they receive the teaching from Timothy, they're not going to go and turn and teach something contrary. Or say, we don't want to look at that. As the people in Asia did, as they had turned from the gospel. As they had turned from from Paul. But we needed to have it to faithful individuals, to trustworthy men and women who would be able to understand and retain the gospel enough to where they in turn could teach it in its fullness, in its entirety to others as well and continuing this cycle. Keep it going. 
and then you will be strong in the grace of Jesus Christ. Timothy is to equip them with the Word of God so that they could teach others. In 2 Timothy 3 and in verse 16, notice what the Apostle Paul says here. 2 Timothy the third chapter and in verse 16. It says here, All Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be complete, thoroughly equipped for every good work. God inspired this gospel. But not only that gospel that not only saves man, but it, the gospel also has the power to equip us unto every good work, to show that there is a benefit behind it. And it's profitable in all those different areas that it just stated. It is beneficial in that area. And Timothy was to keep preaching this very message that he heard from Paul that was, in fact, the gospel, avoiding these cowardly tendencies that we know he struggled with from these two letters. We can see that this was something that he didn't have full confidence in. He trusted in the Bible, he tr or he trusted in the gospel message that he heard from Paul, but yet his cowardliness was something that maybe affected him greatly. But he needed to teach it to others who were trusted as well, to gain confidence to where he could do that. That's the important part here. But notice also Paul, he says that we can be strong in the grace by serving as a soldier. We are to endure hardship like a soldier would. When In 2 Timothy 3 and in verse 12, Paul says here, Yes, and all who desire to live godly will have an easy life know what he says. Yes, and all who desire to live godly will suffer persecution. 2 Timothy 4 and in verse 5. But you be watchful in all things. Endure easy times. Endure afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Fulfill your ministry. Christians will have to suffer because of the demands of their faith. In Revelation, the second chapter in verse 10 the Apostle John exhorts Christians there to be faithful even if it means that their death is something that is imminent, that they're not going to be able to get out of. Be faithful until death and you will receive the crown of life. As he states that, that is a very real thing. There are Christians around the world today who still their lives have been demanded of them probably already in this year, 2019. But yet that's still not a very real thing for us necessarily. We have not had our lives threatened, hopefully. And that hopefully that's something that's not going to happen as of yet. But yet that's still a very real thing that could happen. But what about if we are in a situation like Paul is in here when he's writing this letter in 2 Timothy? We know he's been in prison for preaching the gospel. The government that we live in at this time still does support the open-based religion that we are able to serve God fully. It's not something that we have to be fearful of assembling here to worship God and having authorities come in and arrest us for this, thankfully. But what about if we lowered the bar even a little bit lower? Notice in 1 Peter 4 and in verse 4 a little bit about the hardships that we may have to face in this life. 1 Peter 4 and in verse 4, the Apostle Peter he says here, as he's just recently stated a bunch of different practices of the world, he follows here in verse 4 of 1 Peter 4, In regard to these, they think it strange that you do not run with them in the same flood of dissipation, speaking evil of you. Peter here in this verse, he's reminding Christians that the worldly peers around you, that they're going to speak evil of you when you no longer engage in the practices with which they're involved in. When you say that, oh, I'm a Christian, I'm not going to be involved, I'm not going to go to your parties, they're going to speak evil of you. How real of a thing is that for our high school age students? When you have your friends that are saying, hey, it's Friday night, we don't have school tomorrow, we're all going over to so-and-so's house and you know their, their parents are gone, we're going to have some music playing, some different things. Some alcohol maybe. 
Why don't you come over? It'll be a real good time. But yet, it comes into play where are you going to stand up for your faith? And I hope and trust that you will. And when that does take place, it's a very real thing that your friends, they may be in this party here that are going to speak evil of you. You know, they said they're a Christian. They're not trying to go to this party with us. What's that all about? What kind of a joke is this? Why? But when we are Christians, when we are standing for these different statutes that the Bible tells us we need to, that we have to uphold these things, we can no longer participate in these different practices of the world with them because of the demands of our faith. And that's a hardship that we can endure, that the people that we do care about, they may not respect us because of our decisions to stand for the principles that we uphold with our faith. But young people must stand strong against the pressures that their peers may oppose to them. Even if it means that they may lose their friends in that instance for, for standing for their faith. And what a wonderful thing. And what a wonderful encouragement we can be to them in that instance. But soldiers, as, Timothy, as Paul states to Timothy, soldiers press on regardless the circumstances, regardless of what it is that is going on. When a soldier receives orders from their commanding officers, they're going to do every single thing, use every ounce of fiber in their body to complete that task, to fulfill those orders. He will do everything he can to make sure that they're accomplished. No matter if it's snowing or raining or there's war breaking out around them, we're pressing on, we're marching on, we're carrying on to, get, to complete the orders with which we've been assigned that's what a good soldier does. Why? But why is, why is that something that I have to do? That I have to understand that mentality that I've been assigned orders by Christ and I need to fulfill them. It's because I'm in the Lord's army. And it's the greatest army that there has ever been in the existence of mankind. The most important army that we could have ever signed up for and we have a duty to please Him who enlisted us, being Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. I have to stay faithful to my captain. Notice in Hebrews, the second chapter, and in verse 10, what the Hebrew writer says. It says here, in Hebrews 2 and in verse 10, we see who is our captain. It says here, For it was fitting for him for whom we are all things, and by whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering. Jesus is our captain. He's the one with whom we receive these orders, and it is our utmost importance and responsibility to carry them out, to fulfill these different tasks. As soldiers, we've been enlisted in the Lord's service and are required to follow His commandments. It is the most important task that we have been assigned in our lives, to uphold this standard, to live according to these things. And being a good soldier, if we're following these different tasks, we must avoid the entanglements of this life, as the text states. And notice in 2 Peter 2 and in verse 20, notice what the Apostle Peter says. In 2 Peter, the second chapter, beginning with verse 20, Peter says here, For if after they have escaped the pollutions of this world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The latter end is worse for them than the beginning. For it would have been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness than having known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered to them. In this context here, we have some false teachers who are saying, you know, the, those different sins, those worldly pleasures that you may have been involved in, it states as lasciviousness as being one. You don't necessarily have to come out of those practices in order to be pleasing to God. And these people that had worked so hard to overcome their different fleshly desires, they've made, taken that effort and progressed in those steps to where they've came out of it. They're serving God, they're living as a soldier of Christ should, but yet now they're again entangled in them. Why? Because someone said, you don't have to really overcome them. You can get by without it. 
You can still be pleasing to God without putting away those sinful things that are condemned in here. That's not true. They have to be able to put away those worldly desires, to trust in the Word of God, and be able to fulfill the commandments that are given to me by who? By the captain of my salvation, Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God. We have to fulfill these tasks that we have been given. In Luke the 8th chapter, and in verse 14, notice what Jesus says here in the parable of the sower. In Luke the 8th chapter, and in the 14th verse, Jesus here is he's giving explanation for the different types of soul, uh, soils and their relationship to the hearts of men. He says here in Luke 8 and in verse 14, Now the ones that fell among the thorns are those who when they have heard go out and are choked with cares, riches, and pleasures of life and bring no fruit to maturity. Now in this parable of those that are, in the parable of the sower, this ground with the thorns, is applied by Jesus of being the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches. These different things are things that can entangle me, that can hold me back, that can prevent me from pr producing fruit to maturity in serving God to the fullest of my ability, of completing the different commandments I've been given. But, you know, there's a lot of things in this life, there's a lot of pleasures in this life that are not necessarily sinful, in and of themselves. But they can easily take us away from focusing on the commandments that we've been given, on the things that we need to focus on and follow through with. When we think about lawful recreation, it's something that can take up more and more of our time progressively the more that we get involved with a certain outside activity. But And when that happens, it keeps us from growing spiritually in the Word of God. When the pleasures of playing golf or developing our skill in some sort of, of, of sport or something, or perhaps watching television, these different things, they can take precedence over our study of the Bible, of continual growth in these different things that we need to follow through on. And assembling for worship, they can become something that is going to hold me back. These entanglements of the world can prevent me from being a good soldier and pleasing Him who enlisted me in His service. When we are not equipping ourselves with the Word of God, we are equipping ourselves to be engaged with things of the world that can be uh, pulling us away from being good soldiers of Christ. If you look in Ephesians 6 and in verse 10, we must be active soldiers of Christ. In Ephesians, the 6th chapter, and in, and in the 10th verse, the Apostle Paul says here, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in the heavenly places. Therefore, Take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all, to stand. Put on the whole armor of God. When we, take, we need to take action when it comes to being strong as a soldier of Christ. There is something on our part that we have to do to take up the whole armor of God. What, is, what, ex, what all is it exactly that we need to be doing? What actions are we talking about here? Put on the armor of God. What do I need? I, do I only need the helmet? Do I only need the sword? No, we need to take up the whole armor of God that we may be thoroughly equipped, ready for everything. The whole armor needs to be put on. I need the whole armor of God because I'm fighting the spiritual hosts of wickedness and in the heavenly places. But when you think about it, when it says there in verse 13, withstanding, to withstand all in the evil day means that we will resist the day when we are tempted. When those temptations are something that are creeping in my life, I'm going to be able to stand against them. I'm going to be able to overcome them. How? How can I do that if I'm not properly equipped? 
if I don't have the right tools about me to where I can fight this spiritual battle and overcome the things that may entangle me and prevent me from being a good soldier of Christ? How is that something that I can do? But you see, when we have done all, when we've taken every measure, when we've equipped ourselves with the whole armor of God, we've beaten our temptation, then we stand. We stand strong in the Lord's grace. We uphold ourselves, and we are standing strong. What a wonderful thought. We also are to be strong in the grace by competing like an athlete would. An athlete must be willing to abide by the rules. That's the strong principle that, uh, that Paul focuses on in 2 Timothy, the second chapter. The Christian as well, though, must be willing to abide by the rules that we've been given. The rules that we find in our Bible. And God is the one that has revealed these rules and we must live lawfully before God if we are going to compete according to these rules. If we are focusing on them and making them a priority in my life, then I'm going to live according to them. An athlete must, accord, uh, must compete according to the established rules or he will be disqualified from the race. Notice in 1 Corinthians 9, and in the 24th verse, 1 Corinthians 9 and in verse 24, notice what the Apostle Paul says here. He says here, Do you not know that those who run in a race all run, but one receives the prize? Run in such a way that you may obtain it. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it for an, for, to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown. Therefore I run thus, not with uncertainty, thus I fight, not as one who beats the air, but I discipline my body and bring it into subjection, lest when I have preached to others, I myself should be qual become disqualified. Run in such a way that you may obtain the prize to be focused in that way. A runner who decides with himself when he's lined up with all the other runners and the race is about to begin, if he says to himself, you know, if I take off just maybe a second or two before that starter pistol, I'll get a pretty good head start. And it statistically would work out advantageously. He'd take off before the other runners. He would have a head start. But would that be competing according to the rules? Would that be something that would be fair and lawful? Would that be something that would be accepted when the judges are looking at it? No. He has to compete according to the rules. He has to follow the different things with which are established in that, in that time. And if he doesn't, he will be disqualified. In 2 John 9 and in verse 11, we have rules that are provided to us on how we should live during our time in this life. And notice what the Apostle John says regarding one who willingly goes beyond the rules that have been applied or have been given to us. In 2 John and in verse 9, whoever transgresses and does not abide in the doctrine of Christ does not have God. He who abides in the doctrine of Christ has both the Father and the Son. If anyone comes to you and does not bring this doctrine, do not receive him into your house nor greet him. For he who, he who greets him shares in his evil deeds. If we choose not to heed the rules that have been given to us, to understand them and apply them, but rather we're going to go beyond them, we will be disqualified. We will not be able to compete in this race. This is such an important matter that we are... Why would we be willing to jeopardize our fellowship with God, our, our fellowship with Jesus Christ, our captain, the one with whom we are taking orders? Why would this be something that it would be worth it? It's not. We have to compete according to the rules, according to the principles and the statutes that have been given to us, and then compete lawfully in them. As the athletes are to be competing according to the rules and gaining that prize, the same way the Christian must live according to the things that we've been provided by Jesus Christ in the gospel, according to the doctrine of Christ for this incorruptible crown, for my salvation. As we read, if we don't do that in 1 Corinthians 9, that we will be disqualified. <coughs> if we don't bring ourselves into subjection, if I don't discipline my body to say, you know, I, I have to follow these commandments. 
I have to follow the rules that have been given to me because they're already established. They are God's inspired word. And it's the only way that I can be saved. Finally, we can be strong in the grace by being like a farmer who looks toward his fruitful harvest. A farmer works hard during the whole season, but he is looking forward to that final reward of having a harvest that is very plentiful. But a farmer must be the first to partake of his harvest, as Paul states in 2 Timothy 2 and in verse 6. But why is that? Why is it that the farmer has to be the first to partake of his crop? It's because it is his hope. It is what he has been working so diligently for. It's what he has been focused on during the whole springtime when he's sowing. And then when it finally does come to that harvest time, it is what he has been hoping for, what he has been longing for. <clears throat> Farming is extremely hard work, and the farmer can sometimes grow weary. Christians as well, when we are dealing with these different things, taking up that whole armor of God, it's not exactly the easiest thing to do. And we can become tired. We can become fatigued in our faith, if you will. But notice what Paul says in Galatians 6 and in verse 6. <coughs> Pardon me. Galatians 6 and in the 6th verse, notice what the Apostle Paul says here. It says here, Let him who is taught the word of God share in all good things with him who teaches. Do not be deceived, God is not mocked. For whatever a man sows, that he will also reap. For he who sows to his flesh will of the flesh reap corruption. But he who sows to the Spirit will of the Spirit reap everlasting life. And let us not grow weary while doing good. For in due season we shall reap if we do not lose heart. Don't grow weary. Farming is very hard work. That farmer, it takes a lot of motivation for him to get out in the morning and say, you know, i got to go and maintain these crops as they're growing, as they're coming up. I got to go and make sure that they have enough water. I got to go and make sure that the weeds aren't coming up in the middle of the crop. I have to go and take these actions to make sure that the harvest is going to be plenty. And that's tiresome. That can be very weary. But the Christian will reap what he sows. And at the harvest time, he should expect nothing more or nothing less than what it is according to the work that he put in during the the sowing time. There's never been a farmer who only sowed seed in just a couple rows. And at the harvest time in the fall, he woke up one morning and his crop was ready to be harvested. And he said, where's my acres? Where's the hundreds of acres that I should be reaping? No, he didn't put in the work for that. That's not something that he went for. But farmer knows that patience in not in, is needed in his daily life. It has to be something that he is willing to hold on to, to cling to. No farmer has ever planted one day and then woke up the next morning and said, my, my crops have not grown yet. Patience is something that they do understand. Notice in James, the fifth chapter, in the seventh verse, James 5 and in verse 7, The Apostle James says here, Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of our Lord. See how the farmer waits in the precious fruit for, for the precious fruit of the earth, waiting patiently for it until it receives the early and the latter rain. You also be patient. Establish your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is at hand. Do not grumble against one another, brethren, lest you be condemned. Behold the judgment, behold the judge is standing at the door. My brethren, take the prophets who spoke in the name of the Lord as an example of suffering. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and very merciful. Be patient, and God will reward us for the work that we put in, in equal proportion to it. If we are going to work now, then we will be rewarded plentifully when the Lord does come again. The time to take action is now to make sure that we are preparing ourselves, that we are working now while we still have daylight, if you will. 
The harvest is going to come. There will come a time when it is going to happen. And we will take up the count of our crop, of how we did. How was it that we did on that judgment day? And we will have to give a report to Jesus Christ, the Son of God, the captain of our salvation. We need to be strengthened in the grace of Christ. Paul exhorts Timothy to consider what has been written there in, verse, in 2 Timothy 2 and in verse 7. As he says there, Consider what I say, and may the Lord give you understanding in all things. Knowing that God will give him understanding, he's looking at these different aspects of how he can be strong in the Lord's grace. Consider Paul's words. Are you strong in the Lord's grace? Consider Onesiphorus and the perfect example that he set of a man who's standing in the grace of the Lord. He and the members of his household as they're willing to go out of their way to serve Paul, to be true servants to him. Onesiphorus is the perfect example of standing strong in the grace of Christ Jesus. Consider the importance of the gospel. You will understand why you should never be ashamed of the Lord's faithful testimony, of how Timothy was to not be fearful of it and cowardly, but be willing to understand it and apply it to his life so that he could then teach others everything that Paul told him regarding the gospel and its saving grace. Consider the service of a soldier. Understand that how you must avoid being caught up in the affairs of this life. Yes, we have to endure hardship. Yes, there are things that we have to dwell with, but we still keep going. We still press on because someone has given us higher orders. And we're going to do everything in our power to make sure that they're completed, that they are followed through with. Consider the crowned athlete, how he must uh, compete according to the rules if he's going to be receive that prize. Understand that only those who live according to God's law will receive that incorruptible crown as we so diligently seek to gain. Con compete in that way that we may obtain it according to the rules, lawfully. Consider the farmer how he is anticipating his harvest and realize that the tasting of your eternal reward is still ahead of you and the time to work is now. Serve courageously, compete lawfully, anticipate hopefully that final day when we will be reunited with God on that judgment day and you will become strong in the grace of Christ. Have you submitted yourself to the gospel and been saved by His grace? Do you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, that these teachings that we have at our fingertips this evening are truly the Word of God? And they demonstrate to us how it is that we must live in our lives if we're going to be pleasing in His eyes. If you understand that and you believe Jesus Christ was truly the Son of God, that He died in place for your sins and as part of the grace that God extended to mankind, if you understand that, if you believe that, and you're willing to confess that before these great witnesses tonight, we would love to assist you in working with you. We'd love to baptize you for the remission of your sins and then start working with you. If you've already done all these different things and you've become a child of God already, but yet you're not living in a way to where you can say, I'm strong in the grace of the Lord, we would urge you to reconsider your life, to reconsider the choices that you've been make, making, and if they really are worth it, we know that the things of this life can be hard on us. But we have to endure hardship. We have to compete lawfully according to the rules. And then in anticipation, we are waiting for that reward. We understand these things. And if we can't assist you at this hour, won't you come while we stand and while we sing?